We're here with Professor David Yermak, who runs the FinTech specialization at the NYU Stern School of Business, where he also chairs the finance department and chairs the effort around law and, what is it? Business. Law and business. <laughs> Thanks, a lot of credentials in there. Anyways, all things crypto, one of our most popular segments was talking to Professor Yermak about trends in cryptocurrencies. It's been about five months and we wanted to check in. Please respond in our comments if you would like to see something like this every week. We get a ton of interest in crypto. So with that, since we last sat down, Professor Yermak, give us some of the updates of what's happened in the world of crypto. Well, there was a spectacular run-up in the fall that culminated in Bitcoin briefly trading for about $20,000 yep. shortly before Christmas. Then it dropped 70%. Now it's doubled. It's, in other words, it's been a very wild ride, but Bitcoin, as we do this, is trading above 11,000, which is a very high value compared to what it was you know, a year ago. So the yep. rates of return for investors have been very high. Probably the biggest news event was the listing of futures on the commodities exchanges in Chicago. There are now Bitcoin derivatives that are very much part of the financial mainstream now that they're on places like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And this was, I think, an act of regulatory forbearance by the Commodities Future Trading Commission. The U.S. regulator had umpteen ways they could have prevented this from happening, but ultimately let the product take hold. And even though there were some people predicting catastrophes and glitches in the markets, none of that has come to pass. It's the legitimacy, a yeah. huge, an EpiPen of legitimacy to crypto. It has you know, really traded in a very ordinary way and provided for the first time really a product that allows you to bet against these things, that up until now, you could own them and expect them to go up, but there was really no way to predict and bet against them dropping in value. Once those futures were listed, I think it's no accident that Bitcoin dropped 70% in the next month or so. But the market has um, now seen some stability. I would expect you're going to see many, many more of these derivative products, not just around Bitcoin, but around many of the cryptos coming in the months and years ahead. Does, ex does being traded on a futures exchange decrease volatility or does that have no... It's meant to. Yep. It's the, the ideal futures contract is for something that has a lot of volatility that people are looking to manage. So in that sense, the cryptocurrencies are absolutely ideal. And it's too soon to know, but if you look at the last month or two of trading, it does seem that there's been less volatility than there was in the fall when it was spiking up really to crazy levels. And has there been more institutional investment? Is there more, is there greater quote unquote credibility? I saw Jamie Dimon went from saying it was a fraud or it was illegitimate to all of a sudden softening his stance on it. Any additional signs of legitimacy or it entering the mainstream? There are not any investment companies that are putting products out in the market for regular consumers. This really hasn't been permitted yet by the SEC and other regulators. Um, there's a lot of interest in this and I think you're going to eventually see this happen in another country if it doesn't happen in the US. But the big asset management firms still don't have products on the market that are directly based on crypto. I think the best you can do is indirectly invest by looking at the companies in the mainstream that are vendors who are making the mining equipment, the special chips, or who are introducing blockchain enterprise solutions to people in the logistics business. You can earn their stocks. and that probably makes a lot of sense if you're a believer in the underlying technology. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the ratio of legitimacy and value of Bitcoin, sort of the big kahuna versus the altcoins. What are the trends? Uh, so for example, I saw Bitcoin was up 6% today, but Ethereum was down 1%, and I think Litecoin was down. So it seems like there's a bit of a diversion. Well, they are not particularly correlated with each other. Um, this is surprising because you would think that these would more or less move as a group, but each has its own business case. And even last year when Bitcoin was way up, there were others that rose considerably more. Um, Ripple, for instance, was one of the big success stories. And also, I think Ethereum rose by a factor of 30 last year, some ungodly return. But um, at any given time, there are issues of technology and regulation that may apply more to one coin or token than to others. And so you're not going to see them move in lockstep. And they don't necessarily serve as hedges against each other either. So if Bitcoin is meant to be a store of value and a means, uh, uh, an alternative currency, 
aren't some of the altcoins, for example, Ethereum, aren't they, in addition to being a store of value and a new age currency, don't they also have some underlying intrinsic technology value? I've heard Ethereum is for contracts. Yeah. So g give us a rundown on the biggest altcoins and what the underlying technology or intrinsic value is and any viewpoint you have on those, you know, how much of it is, where is there a there there around some of these underlying technologies? You have, at this point, more than 1,500 tokens, and there are more almost every week coming to the market. The clear number two is Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And Ethereum, like Bitcoin, is a blockchain-based token, but it's meant to execute smart contracts that you can essentially give contingent instructions for insurance products and for the execution of promises that depend on each other. So if you don't make your car payment, your car will automatically be shut off. And then you use the Ether tokens to provide what's called the gas to make that contract execute in the background. Or you can use the Ether tokens as payment to fulfill a commercial promise, maybe as a bond or a collateral payment for people who stipulate that they'll perform some act and then either do or don't do it. So Ethereum is a very ambitious language that's meant to create this really new framework called the smart contract that would be a self-executing, self-verifying contract. In other words, a contract that doesn't need lawyers to enforce it when things go wrong. And it raises many novel legal problems, but at the same time will solve many others. And in particular, you don't have to go to court and get a lien when people don't keep their promises. These smart contracts just automatically execute with certainty and you have to live with the consequences. So cut out the sheriff, cut out the repo man, Exactly. Just something happens and maybe you figure out a signal that turns off the Tesla or whatever it is and you can no longer, or cuts off your cable, whatever it no, might be. That's the classic example is it shuts off the ignition of your car remotely and these days the car could probably drive itself back right. to the lot. Right. So no more repo man. The costs of dispute resolution, in other words, are driven down and the cost of verification, if you can somehow use sensors remotely to the Internet of Things, as it's sometimes called, to police people's behavior and compliance, you can really eliminate an awful lot of costs related to verification and enforcement. And the real point of this is to solve moral hazard problems. A lot of people don't pay their car loans because they know it's costly to foreclose, and so I can miss a couple payments. Um, they won't think that way once they know with certainty some machine in the background is going to shut off their car. Then you'll get much, not only better compliance by borrowers, but people may stay out of the credit pool entirely. And so you'll improve the quality of the people who do show up to borrow. So the, in theory, that sounds outstanding. I've also read that the number of companies actually using underlying Ethereum technology is not that great. Have, has this been adopted by a lot of firms? There's a lot of beta testing going on, and the insurance industry looks like really the place where this would have the most long-term impact. Um, a huge amount of interest, but it, other than some niche products, like there's an Ethereum flight insurance contract that you can buy. So if your flight is delayed two hours, it pays over the ether to you into your digital wallet without anyone having to verify this and so forth. These are really proof of concept at this point. And I think um, in the long run, they may play a really important role, but not until some legal issues are clarified. You know, it's possible that you and I could have a smart contract that actually violates consumer protection law. Mm -hmm. And then how does this get sorted out in court when a lawyer goes for an injunction, but it's impossible to shut the contract off and it's not located in anyone's jurisdiction. You can imagine that in the long run, this would make more work for lawyers rather than less because so many novel problems might be created. So, so Ethereum, smart contracts, what's the next one? The next one is probably Ripple. Mm -hmm. And Ripple's a little different than the others. It's um, not a public blockchain so much as a conduit for payments. And Ripple has positioned itself as an alternative to the SWIFT network for international money transfers. So you know if you're in London and want to send money to your bank account in New York, it'll take you three days and a 7% fee. And you wonder, like, why so much? Why, you know, it seems unnecessary. Ripple will do it in the blink of an eye for free. And the SWIFT network has been notoriously insecure because there are tens of thousands of banks linked into it. And the weakest link in the chain is where the thieves enter in and very famously hack the system. 
Um, Ripple, I think the security is the real point of differentiation, but also the speed and cost. So the SWIFT network now has been forced to reconsider its own technology. I think competition is very good and probably long overdue. And I think the Ripple people were very shrewd to identify this one use case for their coin and to try to build up a critical mass of business, which they have. Litecoin. Litecoin is a knockoff of Bitcoin. Um, it's still unclear to people what Litecoin is good for, although you do see more and more people accepting it as payment. Litecoin is easier to mine than Bitcoin, and it is blocked four times faster. So in the case of Bitcoin, you have a new block roughly every 10 minutes. In the case of Litecoin, the cycle is set to two and a half minutes, so you get quicker confirmation of transactions. Um, Litecoin looks, in, in most other ways, a lot like Bitcoin, but it has its own blockchain, its own history, and ultimately, you would think that if Bitcoin is valuable, Litecoin should be valuable for the same reasons, but you would also think that maybe Litecoin is unnecessary, that it you know, it's just sort of looks like Bitcoin divided by four but it doesn't trade for one fourth of Bitcoin. It trades for a pretty significant value, but nowhere near a quarter of a Bitcoin. Litecoin is more democratic in the sense that the hardware that works on their blockchain is not the same hardware that works for Bitcoin and most of the other cryptos. In other words, you can't just bring more horsepower into the race and get an edge against other people. They've preserved an element of randomness due to the fact that they have this S-crypt mining protocol that relies on a different part of your machine instead of the Bitcoin technology that just really relies on who has the fastest processor. Another big trend, forking. Explain what forking is and why there's so much of it right now. A fork is where a blockchain is adding blocks every 10 minutes, say, in Bitcoin, and then basically it diverges. And this can happen sometimes spontaneously because two miners win at the same time and they both continue to mine in their own direction, those are resolved basically by a process of consensus, usually in a few minutes. But some forks are deliberate, where people will upload an alternative version of the software and invite people to opt out of the old code and to adopt theirs. So this is sort of like a group of the shareholders of a company saying, we don't agree with management, we have a different strategy, and as many people who want follow us in this direction, and then they're able to maybe divide the stock and take some of the assets with them. So this has happened now once with Ethereum and twice with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And what it's led to is competing versions where they have a common history up to the point of the fork. In the case of Ethereum, you have still something called Ethereum, but the original one called Ethereum Classic. It's like a schism where they both claim to be the Pope. And you have, in the case of Bitcoin, there was a fork called Bitcoin Cash that occurred last August. Bitcoin Cash was meant to increase the block size, multiplied it by a factor of eight so that Bitcoin could accommodate the growing number of users who wanted to use it. And not long afterwards, in October, something called Bitcoin Gold was a second fork that went in the other direction. It made it you know, essentially reinforce some of the orthodoxy of the original Bitcoin. And these are all catering to user communities who fundamentally have different visions of the future of the coin. So it's interesting because forks are about governance and discipline of the people in charge. But what is the governance? Who gets to make well, these decisions? Yeah, there is nobody in charge, which is why it's interesting. And when Bitcoin was launched, there was a folklore that when you had disagreements, anyone could put out a new version of the software. And if they got 51% to run that software, that would become the new code. So could we start, could we do Bitcoin Stern and eventually try and come up? So we'd have to come up with some sort of code that said this is an enhancement, and then we go out and lobby Bitcoin owners to Ex try and... Yeah, and it turns out you don't need 51%. You just need enough enough to sustain a blockchain, you know, to mine it regularly and so forth. So it looks like rather than two versions, you might have many versions of Bitcoin if it keeps growing. And whether this is a good or a bad thing remains to be seen. It's certainly something very new in finance. And it's a very organic bottom-up form of governance where people who disagree, if you can get enough of them together, they go off on their own fork with their own version of the software Ultimately, they have to convince other people that this is the best way. You know, pe people who might accept 
the token and so forth. The, um, the Bitcoin cash was thought to be almost a joke that wouldn't have any value, but it's trading right now for about $1,500. And the people who got it, if you own Bitcoin before August 1st, which was the date of the fork, you now own both. You still have your original Bitcoin, but you have the fork. And today, you have a choice. If you want to buy into it, you could buy either, you could buy both. But if you happen to have owned it before the fork occurred, you get both versions. So $700 billion total market cap for all coins. And I know you don't like to get in the business of coin picking. But if you were to guess in five or 10 years, are we more likely to see the total market cap of cryptos at $100 billion or $70 trillion? <laughs> what, do you, are you Because it sounds like you're definitely bullish on the blockchain. But you're measured and you're thoughtful around the value of the specific coins. But taken as the market cap of the whole sector, um, trying to time is a fantastic smoother of of of, of modulation or way or a great modulator of waves. But is the regression line upward here for crypto over the next few decades? I think it is. But I say this partly because I think a lot of the mainstream financial technology will cross over. That in ten years. I think all the stock markets will be using these digital assets with blockchains to clear transactions. I think the sovereign currencies will be moved onto blockchains controlled by central banks. This will get to the point where this actually becomes the mainstream financial system, where you recognize that this technology is so valuable that it shouldn't just be for these private coins and tokens, but the real institutions that are the foundations of the economy, the central banks and stock markets and so forth, will find ways of co-opting the technology and integrating it into people's routine daily business. Um, I fully expect that cash, physical cash, will be gone probably within 10 years in, in most parts of the world. And I think all of the financial records on stock markets, bond markets, derivative markets will all be kept on blockchains. But whether these will be private blockchains where people compete on a decentralized basis and there's no central authority, I'm skeptical about that because I think for a lot of people, the comfort of a central authority of political oversight is still going to be very important. Doesn't this, and maybe this is a, a utopian or a glass half full viewpoint, but doesn't this hopefully bring down taxes while increasing tax revenue because government should have an easier time taking all revenues from the shadow economy into the legitimate taxable economy? That's completely correct. The attraction of this technology as central banks is that you can completely defeat money laundering and tax evasion. And it's actually a lot of money at stake just in those two things, even in the United States and much more in other shadow economies. So go back to the, this notion of mining and environmental concerns around the notion that I think I read somewhere that the carbon gas, carbon emissions from Bitcoin might, might be equivalent or rival a, a medium sized country in Europe at some point. There are estimates of how many computers are hooked up to the Bitcoin network and doing the work of mining. And as the value of Bitcoin increases, more computers come online because a reward is given every 10 minutes to whomever solves the block. And the reward is 12 and a half Bitcoins, which amounts to $130,000, $140,000. So people do the math and they say, if there's $140,000 reward, that's equivalent to 5,000 gallons of gasoline that are used to mine every Bitcoin. They just do the math of a price of a gallon of gas and they think that there must be a first order condition where people will enter into the mining business up to the point where the cost of the energy equals the value of the reward that they hope to get. Now, it's hard to verify this exactly. There's no question Bitcoin burns a lot of energy and you can do the math and say it's more than Ireland, it's more than Denmark. But we don't really know that. And the one thing that's obvious is that Bitcoin miners tend to locate where energy is cheap and abundant. So many of them have been in Iceland, in Inner Mongolia. Lately, Quebec has become the so, hotspot. So there are no carbon emissions from hydropower. So if you're mining Bitcoin based on hydropower, you're not adding any carbon emissions. Exactly. And you're cooling your stuff for free. You can just open the window in Quebec or Iceland, and it keeps the computers nice and cool. So I think a lot of the people who make these back of the envelope estimates are greatly exaggerating the, the power consumption. But I think the bigger point they're making is a lot of computer resources that could otherwise be doing good work somewhere in the world are being diverted to the guessing of random numbers. And wouldn't it be better if the work 
in the proof of work system in mining, wouldn't it be better if that work could be useful to society, like doing weather forecasting or cancer research or something like that, anything that requires a lot of parallel processing? Or is there maybe a better way besides proof of work? And there's other systems being proposed, such as proof of stake, proof of space, proof of importance, which are interesting. And it looks like even Ethereum may be transitioning to proof of stake. And many of the other coins being designed are tweaking or even junking altogether the proof of work for some alternative. I think this is one of the main design issues facing the whole area. Is, is proof of work really the best and only way to go about it? Um, I don't think you'll ever have the problem, though, of Bitcoin soaking up all the energy in the world. If this ever became a real issue, that there was so much demand for electricity, the price of energy would go up and the market would clear where supply would equal demand. And for people to say it's not socially useful, I think we could make this criticism of teenagers playing video games of many Our best uses. and brightest are at Facebook and not at NASA now. I mean, we could make yeah. the same argument. Yeah. But isn't what you're saying somewhat of an endorsement of altcoins versus Bitcoin? Because altcoins, the human capital going in or the IQ energy going into that have some underlying intrinsic value versus mining Bitcoin is just chasing, chasing the reward. I think Bitcoin was an extremely clever combination of a verification protocol, the proof of work, with a database technology, which is the blockchain and the use of financial incentives to draw people onto the, onto the network or cause them to leave at the right time. So it's a really clever combination of technology and incentives. But it was a first cut at an extremely ambitious problem. And you've seen in the nine years since Bitcoin went live, a ton of innovation. I think this will continue for the foreseeable future. So the fact that bright young people are working for some of these other startups looking to improve on this, this is what makes ultimately innovation and economic growth occurs when smart people invest their human capital in solutions to important problems. And I think it's exactly what you're seeing here. It's a great example of people responding to signals from the marketplace and markets allocating resources, both physical and human, in ways that you really couldn't do nearly as well through any kind of central planning or rules-based system. And as someone who studies this, which of the coins have an underlying technology that you are most bullish on? What I can tell you from the history of tech innovation is that these things tend to get overtaken pretty quickly. That even if you and I could identify the best token today, yep. somebody could come up with something better six months from now. There are no barriers to entry. We saw this with the internet with things like the browser wars, where people would get a hold on the market briefly, but in the end, innovation by outsiders will make their product shrink away. Look at how Yahoo was overtaken in search by Google. Um, you look at the music business with iTunes and then Spotify, that you know, more clever platforms come into use almost without warning, and they don't really require a lot of capital to get going. They just require excellent design. So given the number of people who are active in this space, I think the best coins have not yet been invented. That you're, you're going to see a lot of enhancement in product improvements, you know, probably for the foreseeable future. Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, or Netflix, who, who, would, who foots best in terms of their business to issuing a coin? If I, you'd heard one of these companies, but you didn't know which one had issued a coin, which one would you guess it would be? I would guess it would be Amazon, Amazon. because they're moving into retail so aggressively that you know, it just seems like a natural platform to have Amazon coin that could be used to shop at Whole Foods or at the online bookstore, at the same time giving the customers a stake in the business that if Amazon ends up ruling the world, their Amazon tokens will be more and more valuable. So private currencies you know, dedicated to companies, this started with video gaming. And there are all these World of Warcraft games that have internal economies where the tokens actually trade outside the game. You could replicate this easily with Amazon and Facebook. And it's a little bit of a puzzle that they haven't. So you know, large numbers of users and a variety of retail platforms seem to be the optimal conditions for this to become valuable. So finally, tell us about the t-shirt. This is hold on for dear life. This is the investment mantra that it's a wild ride to own these assets. So you really have to feel like you're riding a roller coaster. 
And this is the Ethereum token symbol here. So that wasn't produced so, by Ethereum. That's just a that's just a, a, a funny T. This is for the crypto community, and I wore this through the San Francisco airport where all the Silicon Valley people are changing planes and get the big thumbs up. Oh yeah. Um, people know what this means if they're connected to the crypto space. So nice. My wife found this for me online. It's a good T-shirt. Good stuff. Professor David Uramak, head of the finance department at NYU and also oversees the fintech specialization at NYU Stern School of Business. Please let us know if you'd like to see this weekly or bi-weekly. Professor, thanks for your time. Thank you, Scott. Wreck about to go and join the huddle gang. Huddle gang, huddle gang, huddle gang. Crypto gang, get the game, big gang, all gang, light gang, cash game, blockchain. Whoa, I don't really ever buy stocks, man. Haters want to say I'm in a bubble, man. Chip chew them up like bubble gum. Just made a meal with my pocket chain. Wreck about to go and join the huddle gang. Huddle gang, huddle gang, huddle gang.